be shown on YouTube. Mm. YouTube will not see the grid. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Nifty Lectures, New Ideas in Finance, Technology Show and YouTube. Innovation. Uh, YouTube will not see the grid. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Nifty Lectures. Uh, these lectures are being organized by Jindal School of Banking and Finance at the OP Jindal University. We are very excited to start this series of lectures where we are going to touch upon various topics related to financial innovation, specifically in the finance, uh, in the banking sector uh, related to digital technology. I invite uh, Professor Ashish Bharadwaj, Dean of Chindal School of Banking and Finance to uh, give a welcome address. Thank you very much, Faisal. A very good afternoon to all of you. I'm so delighted that you could join us today. Uh, let me say a few words about us and about the institution and about this unique initiative before we get started. So as my colleague Faisal was saying, uh, to, uh, give a welcome it's, address. Uh, it's an initiative of OP Jindal Global University, which was established in the Indian state of Haryana in 2009 as a fully social science, arts and humanities oriented university. JGU now has 10 interdisciplinary schools in the areas of law, business policy, liberal arts, uh, international affairs, architecture, finance, journalism, environment, and psychology. OP Jindal Global University is, uh, was also conferred with the status of uh, institution of eminence by the government of India. And with that, we've entered a coveted group of 10 public and 10 private universities in India among more than 1,000 plus institutions in the country to be unshackled from regulatory controls and receive full autonomy. We're very privileged to have received this, um, uh, this, this status uh, from the government. Now, within the first 10 years of our existence, uh, we managed to break into the QS rankings on all three levels, QS Asia, QS BRICS, and the World University Rankings. Currently, as per uh, the World University Rankings 2021, JGU is amongst the top 700 universities in the world. Now, as a role model for institutional excellence in um, social sciences, we offer interdisciplinary education and global orientation, in teaching and research in several areas within social sciences, including finance, commerce, and entrepreneurship. Uh, with this mission, the Jindal School of Banking and Finance, which is the eighth school of the university, which was established in 2018, with a very clear vision of bringing about change in the banking system, in finance and financial services industry, as we all continue to navigate through a thicket of global problems, not just financial and technological in nature, but social, public health related, ethical, legal, and even regulatory challenges that we have to deal with. The vision of the School of Banking and Finance is to evolve as an institution that focuses on new technology-led banking, finance, and allied fields to develop professionals who are aware of environmental, ethical, and even developmental issues within finance, but not just of local, but also global relevance. And with this in mind, I'm so happy, along with my colleagues, to kickstart the Nifty Lecture Series, which, as Faisal was saying, stands for New Ideas in Finance, Technology, and Innovation. It's a new form of engagement that we are trying to do with students, with faculty members, young scholars, practitioners, even administrators in our partnered institutions, both in India and outside India. The series, the Nifty series, uh, is an initiative of our Office of International Strategy at the School of Banking and Finance, which is led by two of my colleagues, Professor Shamidhi Roy and Professor Saeed Mohammed Faisal. Um, and let me tell you what we were thinking when we came up with this idea. We were thinking about the disruptions um, in international mobility, 
uh, which is which has been caused by the ongoing pandemic and in fact it gave us the opportunity to engage with our partners to be able to share insights on some very pertinent issues around technology and around finance around law with our partners uh, both in india and abroad in fact i just in the morning i uh, read a news that um the imf the international monetary fund revealed in their uh, they, they do a uh, financial access survey every year and the 2020 report um sh- revealed that access to mobile money and digital financial services in india jumped 17 fold in the last 4 years and this is a pre pandemic figure so you can only imagine the implications this has uh, for financial inclusion for business expansion uh, for study opportunities potential regulatory issues in a country that pretty much represents 18% of of the world's population um I- india i believe has also surpassed china in fintech related investments this year to become uh, the third most funded country behind the us and the uk so th- this was the motivation and going forward we intend to cover uh, the nature the the role and the implications of technological innovations in digital finance be it e payments be it um, uh, ai and blockchain uh, technologies in finance be it fintech or cryptocurrencies be it use of data uh, protection of data privacy of users cyber security issues for businesses and a gamut of financial regulations and tech technology laws that are needed to put things and keep things in order now some of these issues are going to be discussed in today's inaugural lecture which is on digital financial innovation where issues of privacy and regulations in india are also going to be discussed i'm very happy that two of my distinguished faculty colleagues professor shohini sen gupta and professor keerthi pandyal will be speaking on uh, this topic today um at the banking and finance school we are really embracing the diversity and interconnectedness that exists within social sciences not just to understand um, or reimagine how finance is now and how finance should be taught how banking practices should really evolve but we are trying to do this at a university uh, pan jgu level as well the fact that four of the people involved in this nifty initiative and in today's lecture represent disciplines of economics anthropology law and management um and they could really be four different perspectives from them on uh, topics of finance which is which is something we we really uh, believe in and something which we want to share with everyone so once again i congratulate my colleagues fazal and shamadeep for initiating this dialogue and engaging with our partners around the world uh i am grateful to my colleagues shohini and keerthi for taking the time out to speak with everyone today due to time differences uh, and festivities in in certain parts of the world some of our colleagues were not able to join today nevertheless i thank each one of you who's taken the time out to be with us today and i really hope that you benefit from these sessions with that i hand it over to fazal thank you thank you ashish for uh, the introduction of the school and to the lecture series i with that i invite uh, kirti pandeyal <coughs> uh, faculty at jindal school of banking and finance to uh, start with the lecture hello everyone <coughs> excuse me hello everyone uh, good afternoon good morning uh, so like uh, professor ashish and professor faisal have so kindly introduced uh, the topic and introduced us uh, i'll be starting with my presentation on uh, digital financial innovation in india i will be focused specifically on the fintech sector and the innovations which have happened in the fintech sector in the banking and financial technology sector so the f- focus of the presentation today will be the developments that have taken place in india in the last uh, half a decade in the last 5 to 6 years uh, these developments have happened both from the public sector as well as from the private sector and how the market or how the external shocks to the market has spurred the these developments uh, and you know 
caused innovations to happen across the financial sector space in India. The agenda for the discussion today will be uh, as follows. Uh, we'll primarily first start with looking at how the historical innovations in the banking sector have been, what the role of the emerging markets has been in banking sector innovations. And then from the emerging markets in general, we come and uh, focus on the Indian market more specifically. In India, we'll be looking at the unified payments interface, also known as popularly known as the UPI and the development now happening in the private sector and in some public sector apps of one platform, many services. And finally, we will uh, wrap up the presentation with a short question and answer session. So banking industry as we know it today uh, has evolved from a, a traditional sense of banking from the Western and developed world. Traditionally, these innovations have been driven by the developed economies. Uh, we've had credit cards, which were introduced in early 1950s, uh, debit cards, which were introduced soon after in the 1960s and 70s, ATMs, automated teller machines, computerized terminals, wire transfers, and online banking. All of this had been introduced in the developed economies. The advantages of this being that the developed economies had a lot of people who were already a part of the banking system, who did not have to be introduced to the banking system as a whole, and who were aware of the advantages of the banking system, who were utilizing the services and uh, products of the banking system. So any and any innovation which was introduced by the banking system, like the examples mentioned on your screen, the credit cards, debit cards, ATMs, these were uh, technologies or innovations which were driven, which were initiated, which were started to get a, uh, more wider acceptance by the banks to drive down operational costs, to improve operational efficiencies, or introduction of new products, like in the case of credit cards, which would allow people, uh, which would allow the market size to increase and which would allow people to adopt more diverse products and more uh, a variety of increasing products. But the underlying basis of all these innovations was that the market had access to the banking system as a whole. The market had access to the financial system as a whole. There were very few people in the market who did not access the banking system and who did not, who were not covered by the banking system. This drastically changed when you move from the developed economies to the developing economies. The biggest differentiator between the developed economies and the emerging markets is the difference between the number of people who are covered by the financial system, the number of people who are covered by the formal economy. Most economic activities in the emerging markets, uh, be this in the later part of second half of the 20th century, or even today, most of the activities are happening in the informal sector and allowing or getting people to become be covered by the financial system is a major policy point of a lot of governments across the emerging markets. Uh, the Indian government launched a very big uh, big budget and big ticket scheme in 2014 called Jan Dhan scheme, which basically is a scheme allowing for the opening of bank accounts, small ticket bank accounts, small volume bank, uh, small value bank accounts for the poor and the people who were not covered by the banking system. These were bank accounts which had a very little uh, service charges, no minimum balance requirements to be maintained in the account, and you know uh, only the very basic services being provided, like you know the account being uh, offered by the bank. People could uh, deposit money and withdraw money for a fixed number of transactions maximum per month without any transaction charges being levied, so on and so forth. The focus of all these schemes is to get people into the banking system because economists and public policy uh, professionals over the years, over the decades have shown that getting uh, people when they are covered by the banking system, they not only have access to more services and more products, but they also start with the habit of saving, the, you know, inculcating the habit of saving. They are, become more financially literate thus making them less prone towards scams and scandals and being the victims of fraud. 
and more importantly they start after starting at the basic banking services with only a savings account or you know a small loan account people start graduating to more complex products like insurance and you can uh, then start uh, the people can start moving up from basic products of banking and uh, loan accounts to more complicated and more better products to plan for their future to safeguard their future uh, products like insurance products like saving with you know pension schemes saving in mutual funds which will help them to protect their own future and the future of their children this will allow them to prepare for their future so it was always a major challenge of policy makers across the countries economists across the countries in emerging markets to convince people and to draw them into the banking system and one of the biggest hurdles always had been the widespread the lack of widespread nature of the banks the lack of uh, a branch network the lack of a banking network one and the costs involved with the banks themselves now a major part of the innovation that has been happening a lot of innovation that has been happening in the last two decades last three decades in the emerging markets is driven by this necessity is driven by the necessity or by the requirement to cover a lot of these people who are not covered by the banking system solutions developed by private uh, telecom companies so uh, a lot of us would be aware of the mpesa model now mpesa is a solution which has not been developed by a bank or by a regulator but it's a solution which was developed by, by vodafone in africa and used to allow to get people to start saving used to get people to start trans you know transactions from one uh, customer to the another customer all of this was dependent on the mobile phone number of the user another smart solution developed in developing countries was the uh, system of carrier billing uh, to put it in context or to give you an example a young college student might not have a bank account a young school student might high school student or you know a young college student might not have a bank account but chances are he or she has a smartphone and if this student wants to purchase an app or utilize a service on an app a paid service normally the app store requires you to either enter your credit card details your debit card details or your bank account details so as to deduct the charges from the respective accounts in carrier billing what happens is that you opt in for the carrier billing say my carrier is vodafone i opt in for carrier billing and when i purchase an app or purchase a service or a feature of an app google play Uh, because i am using an android phone google play charges my carrier account if it's a prepaid carrier account the money is deducted from my prepaid mobile phone balance if it's a postpaid carrier account it's added to my bill which which i receive at the end of the month as a result there is no money which needs to go out immediately now take this from a college student who is available who is studying in a city or you know a large town or uh, chances are even if even if he or she does not have a bank account he or she is a beneficiary in a bank account of their parents and would have access to the credit card or a debit card of the parent but extend this to a market where a lot of people have smartphones a market like india where there are there are estimated to be more than 700 million smartphones in the country today uh and people not necessarily having a banking facility or a bank account and these people can now utilize or purchase services on the app store purchase services in different apps because all these apps that are available uh, on mobile phones are tied in with google play or apple app store all these people can now utilize services purchase features purchase different services offered by the apps by the option of carrier bill the third example i give here missed call banking is something which has developed out of a unique uh, trait a uh, trait unique i think only to emerging markets uh, the uh, feature of missed call i still remember when i was in my undergraduates uh, i just finished my undergraduate studies and moved out of my hometown for uh, graduate studies my parents always used to and whenever i went out to watch a movie with uh, my friends 
in the uh, late at late night my parents would always tell me give us a missed call once you reach home once you reach the hostel so this was a way of letting people know that i am at the place i am and you know this has evolved into a lot of you know innovative features people started giving two missed calls to say that okay i am all right a single missed call meant a particular message a missed call ringing for ma- making three rings meant a particular message so a lot of these uh, innovations happened uh, driven by the usage of the people themselves so what banks did they utilized on this missed call facility that people already had the habit of doing and they started providing numbers india's largest bank state bank of india actually has a feature where they have a list of numbers and depending on which number you call it uh, the response is received from uh, the bank through an sms telling you okay if you call the first number you get the available balance in your account if you call the second number you get a snapshot of the last five transactions so on and so forth if you want to know what features or what offers are available to you in terms of credit cards or loans you call you call a different number and immediately you get an sms or a call back from the sales executive of the bank informing you of what features are available and what offers are available to you as a customer so what banks have done is taken a behavioral uh modific behavioral activity of the population in general and modified it or and you know customized it to suit the banking requirements of the people now despite all of this despite all these facilities coming now all the examples that have been given here are examples which have were ro- which were rolled out either in the late 90s or in the early 2000s despite all these examples or all these innovations which have happened in the banking sector and the financial sector india in particular did not still have a penetration of the banking system like it was there in the western countries in the developed nations uh, the government started work on a system called the upi the unified payments interface interface which we'll be talking about soon the innovations uh, have started happening because it was the banking sector did not penetrate because the primary mode medium of exchange was still cold hard cash notes or coins the government with a uh, goal of encouraging uh, people to start banking encouraging people to use the formal uh, financial sector rather than the informal financial sector started work on a new system called the unified payments interface this is an example of an innovation from the public sector with the explicit purpose of getting people to start using this system the formal financial channels so one of the key aims of the upi system was that it should be very easy to adopt it should not be as complicated as the previous payment systems that were present in the country so before i talk about upi i will mention briefly about the different payment systems that were there in the country so upi in india is the latest among many payment and settlement systems that were present so india has i think at last count like you can see on the screen six different payment systems uh there is the ecs which is the electronic clearing service this is managed by the rbi there is rtgs real time gross settlement again managed by the rbi neft this is an electronics fund national electronics fund transfer IMPS immediate payment system IMPS bharat bill payment system and UPI these three are managed by a company a not profit company called the national payments corporation of india the national payments corporation of india was established in i think 2008 if i'm not mistaken by the RBI and the consortium of the consortium of banks called the indian banking association initially 10 banks were a part of this consortium and it was later expanded to include other banks as well now the difficulties that come about with each of these systems in ecs rtgs neft and imps in all four of these systems the first and foremost stumbling block is the fact that i need to know the bank account details of the person i am transferring the money to now this could be a natural person an individual like 
myself or Professor Shohini or Professor Ashish, or it could be a company as well, an artificial person. I need to know the bank account details. So the bank account details would be the account number, which bank is the person or the company having an account with, which branch of the company, and there each branch has a particular code. Either I need to know which branch or the code of the branch called the IFSC code, which uh, basically is a financial transaction code uh, among the Indian banking system. Two, along with knowing the financial transactions, most of these three, uh, most of these four systems, uh, sorry, uh, NEFT and ECS, not most, uh, ECS and NEFT, the transactions were not instantaneous. So NEFT earlier used to happen in blocks of 20, 23 blocks spread throughout the day from 12.30 at midnight to uh, 12 at the following day, 12 midnight. Now it has been changed to 48 blocks of half an hour each, starting from 12.30 at uh, midnight today to 12 of the next midnight. So 48 blocks, uh, transactions are not happening on an instantaneous basis. Transactions are happening every half an hour. So even if I put in the instruction for a transaction right now, that transaction will happen anytime over the next half an hour. Similarly with ECS, the transactions are not instantaneous. The difficulty with IMPS is that you, like I mentioned, you need to know the user ID or you, you need to know the financial details of the person to whom you are transferring the money. And RTGS along, although the transfer is real time, it happens instantaneously. RTGS has transaction charges, transaction, uh, you know, fees imposed on it by the banks. So actually all of them, ECS, RTGS, NEFT and IMPS have their own respective transaction charges or transaction fees imposed on based on the uh, value of the transaction being done. Bharat bill payment system is not a peer-to-peer -peer money transfer system. It is more of a bill payment system introduced by the National Payments Corporation of India. So as to pay different various kinds of bills, uh, utilities, different billers, companies, uh, payment service providers, everybody registers on this payment system. And you know, users like you and me can pay our bills through the Bharat bill payment system. So it was in this background that there were no real-time uh, real money transfer facilities available for a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Low cost, uh, you know, capable of handling small volume, uh, small, small value transactions. So a lot of us, when we go to purchase a groceries at a shop or purchase some small items at a shop, the transaction value generally is below rupees 500 or rupees 1000. For our international viewers, that would be about $7, $8, 500 rupees is about $7 and 1000 rupees is about $14. That is the transaction value per each transaction. Most of the transactions in India happening at stores are transactions below this threshold. Now, to use an IMPS, which was the only instantaneous uh, system happening, RTGS was beyond, didn't make sense for making transactions of rupees 500 because the transaction fees involved are very large. Uh, similarly, IMPS was, although it makes sense that the transaction happens instantaneously, because of the transaction fees and because of the requirement that you need to know the financial bank account details of the recipient or the person. In IMPS, you can also request a person, request money from a payee, but you need to know the bank account details or you need to know the details of the person who is going to make the payment. So IMPS also was not widely adopted. UPI was you know, envisaged as a system to bypass these two difficulties. The requirement to know the bank account details or the financial account details of both the parties involved in the transaction, as well as uh, to be able to handle small value transactions, transactions of 100 rupees, which is a dollar, a dollar 50 cents approximately, transactions of uh, 500 rupees, which like I mentioned was about $7. So small value transactions. UPI was built as a system uh, 
to walk around these two difficulties, to bypass these two difficulties. Right from the very beginning, UPI was launched, I think, uh, UPI was launched somewhere in June 2014. Uh, this was a way to transfer money, peer-to-peer uh, -peer transfer of money. It happened instantaneously without any waiting period, like in the case of NEFT. Transfer happens on a real-time basis. As soon as I transfer money uh, from my mobile phone, the recipient can check it on their mobile phone. I, can, I don't need to wait um, more than five or 10 seconds for the recipient to receive a notification based on the carrier signal availability, Vodafone or Reliance Geo, which are, or Airtel, which are some of the carriers here, based on the signal availability, it takes about five to 10 seconds for the recipient to receive a notification that the money has been transferred into their account. And like I pointed out earlier, UPI is mainly used for transactions on small value. This is being encouraged also by the Payments Corporation, National Payments Corporation of India. And this is also being encouraged by the government because they don't want, uh, because of the ease with which transfers can happen on UPI, they don't want it to be uh, used as a system for perpetri perpetrating fraud. So there is a daily cap on the number of transactions which can happen. There is a daily cap on the value of transactions which can happen. And there is also a cap on the value of each transaction in post. So the system is built in such a way that a transaction beyond a daily cap or a transaction beyond a transaction limit will not go through. It will immediately be blocked by the system itself. This is so as to minimize the fraud that have you know, a lot of the uh, retail users have fallen victim to you know, through other payment systems or through other uh, apps and technologies which have uh, mushroomed over the years. This was a safeguard built in consciously into the app. And to address the issue of the knowledge of or knowing the details of the customer or knowing the details of the recipient, the UPI system is also built on in such a way that I don't need to know the bank account details of the person who I'm transferring money to. So for example, if I want uh, Professor Ashish to send me uh, money, all I will tell Professor Ashish or Professor Shohini is to send me money at, uh, I have a virtual payment address. So let's assume I have a bank account at Barclays Bank. Now, Barclays is not present in India. So let's assume I have a Barclay, uh, bank account at Barclays Bank and Barclays is a part of the uh, you know, signed up to UPI uh, system. So Barclays would have uh, assigned all its customers a virtual payment address. Now, customers can choose their virtual payment address unless, of course, it's already been chosen by somebody. So let's say I choose the virtual payment address Kirti at Barclays. So I just tell Professor Shohini, please transfer 1000 rupees to Kirti at Barclays. She doesn't need to know my bank account details. She doesn't need to know which branch I have an account with, what my account number is, what kind of account it is. All she does is open up her app, open up her banking app of, of her choice. It doesn't have to be again, a particular app that needs to be installed. So all banks now offer these services or allow transfer through UPI addresses, a lot of non-banking apps allow transfer through UPI services. She opens up the app of her choice and tells, uh, I want to transfer 1000 rupees, the amount, she enters the amount, 1000 rupees. And the recipient, she enters Kirti at Barclays. And once she does that, so when, when she opens up the app, uh, the next point comes into play, two-factor authentication. When she has opened up the app of her choice, what the app is doing is the app is registered only to the account that Professor Shohini or the mobile phone that Professor Shohini has provided to her bank. So if she opens up that app with the SIM card uh, installed in her phone of a different mobile phone, the app will not function. The app needs to first communicate with the banking server uh, authenticate the app on the phone. This is done at the time of installing the app, wherein you have to uh, send an SMS, automated SMS is sent the first time the app is used. And the app is authenticated by the bank at the back end. Only once the app has been authenticated can Professor Shohini transfer the funds. 
So that is the first step in the two-factor authentication where each device needs to be authenticated by the user for either sending or receiving money. The second uh, part of the two-factor authentication is that Professor Shohini needs to know a PIN code, which ideally she has not shared with anybody else. So when she enters that she wants to send 1000 rupees to Kirti at Parkless, the app that she's using asks her for that PIN code. If she enters the wrong PIN code, the transaction is cancelled. She has to enter the right PIN code and this uh, two-factor authentication, if it is successful, it's only then that the money is transferred to Kirti at Barclays. Of course, Kirti at Barclays is connected to my bank account, which I've already connected at my end by logging into the internet banking facility of Barclays or mobile banking facility of Barclays, or when I set up the account by walking into the branch of Barclays. So Professor Shohini is now having a secure way of transferring money to me. She doesn't need my banking account details and the money can be sent at the click of a button. Instantaneously, the money is transferred. This system has become so successful in India that in the last month, October 2020, there were more than 2 billion transactions which took place on UPI alone. I'll just pause for a moment to let that number sink in. 2 billion transactions have happened in the month of October alone using the UPI payments system. It's been so successful that Google has recommended to the Federal Reserve in the US to build a similar system for the US. The Federal Reserve has, has invited suggestions, invited uh, policy papers or documents from participants on how to build a more a quicker and more robust payment service, payment system, which uh, you know allows for a more seamless transfer of money across different banks and different uh, federal uh, reserve boards across the United States. And Google has recommended a UPI-like system for the United States. So this has been a very fairly successful implementation of the UPI model so far. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly move to the next topic of one payment, uh, one system, many services, one platform, many services. So like I mentioned, UPI transaction volume is at 2.07 billion transactions, and the transaction value is at 3.86 trillion. What this slide is highlighting is what I mentioned earlier. UPI transactions are generally small value transactions, whereas RTGS transactions are large value transactions. They are generally used by businesses and corporations. So in terms of uh, transaction volume, although RTGS transaction volume is very small, in terms of transaction value, it is very large, 84 trillion rupees. Now, this number is actually lower compared to the number in October 2019, the RTGS transaction val val value. In October 2019, we had 104 trillion uh, rupees transferred to the RTGS system. Obviously, this number is low because of the COVID crisis that we are undergoing in the country right now, undergoing around the world. So, the, both the number of transactions, sorry, number of transactions has seen a marginal increase from 12.9 million to 13.8 million, but the transaction value has seen a sharp dip from 104 trillion rupees to 84 trillion rupees. So this is basically uh, what the UPI is doing. Uh, there have been some developments with the unified payments interface recently with uh, several companies launching their payments into uh, third-party payment apps in India. Google has launched had launched their uh, payments app, Google Pay, uh, earlier called Tez in India about three years back. WhatsApp, which so far was running a closed beta for a certain number of users, has now launched, and it's not complete open launch, it's limited to about 100 million users. So I would say it is a more open beta, I would call it a more open beta or a limited rollout of their payment services. Followed immediately, almost immediately after WhatsApp started rolling out their WhatsApp payment system, National Payments Corporation of India came out with a policy paper saying that third-party payment apps, 
like WhatsApp Pay or Google Pay will be limited to 30% market share in the UPI uh, marketplace. So basically that uh, what this means is that apps like WhatsApp or Google who don't have a banking license will not be allowed to do more than 30% transactions every month using UPI. So that is uh, a kind of a segue from uh, UPI to one platform many services because the example I will be giving in one platform many services has the banking license, which uh, makes it, you know, which allows it to be bypass the regulation that NPCI introduced recently that apps or systems who don't have a banking license will not be allowed to have a market share more than 30%. So one platform, many services, as the name suggests, is basically a platform which is offering many services. This came into focus through the development or through the popularity that WeChat uh, had in China and started, you know, once WeChat started spreading across the world through expatriates and people who uh, are traveling to China for uh, business or education purposes or personal uh, visits. You know, a lot of these people had to use what WeChat because of its popularity in China and how uh, because of the services that were available through the WeChat app. It started initially as a text messaging and a voice messaging service, uh, but it quickly ballooned from there and started offering search engine facilities. It started, people could borrow money through WeChat. They could use WeChat as a wallet, as a payment system. Uh, they could pay their bills. A lot of services are utilized or available on WeChat right now. And it has uh, reached such a state or come to such a point that if you don't have a smartphone when you are in China, the options for purchasing, shopping are critically limited because a lot of stores today accept maybe only WeChat or competing systems and don't, you know, very few of them, because of the convenience that's provided, very few, some of them don't accept cash anymore. So it's become very uh, ubiquitous that people need to start having WeChat just because of the network effects that it provides or a similar app because of network effects that are being provided. This success of the success of WeChat in China has been borrowed by governments and by private entities. There were solutions which exist, existed prior to WeChat becoming popular, but these were limited to the B2B uh, services or in the e-governance models. Uh, the a popular one in the case of India is something called a e seva model where uh, the government had kiosks set up, set up across different cities in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And it was a one-stop solution where people could walk in and get different services uh, provided by the government. Registration of births, registration of deaths, uh, obtaining a uh, fitness certificate for vehicles, etc. So the one platform many services model quickly became adopted by the government and the private sector in the government. This is an app called the Umang, which allows the people to utilize various services from the government. And uh, in the private sector, it's being adopted by, a many, by many fintech companies and by many fintech platforms. In today's session, we'll be looking at one such platform, which is Paytm. Now, this is not a pitch or this is not a plug for Paytm, but Paytm is probably the most successful company which has been able to uh, pivot from a core payments provider or a payments platform to providing uh, one platform many services across its platform. Before I look at Paytm, this is a snapshot of the uh, fintech lands landscape in India. So the first column talks about the rows are the different providers or people who provide different services. The fintech uh, landscape divided across according to the industry or according to the service being provided. The columns are the years where the companies have started or when the companies have attained critical mass, depending on uh, how you look at it. So we had a lot of players in the payment system. Paytm is one of those. We had POS solutions, which are point of sale solutions, the credit card and debit card machines we see in uh, restaurants in uh, shops and everything. We had companies providing insurance comparison services or insurance for different devices, healthcare, etc. 
lending companies can taking care of the lending and loans and banking companies which are taking off accounting or expense management companies looking at investment management or personal finance allowing people to purchase mutual funds stocks bonds etc and companies providing banking technology so paytm started as a company in the payment space it was a wallet company uh, to start with people loaded the wallet used it to pay for different services like a cab ride or uh, goods purchase in a store so the merchant also would be registered on paytm the customer like myself would be registered on paytm and once i utilized the service of a cab i would ask the cab driver for their paytm number or a qr code if they had one and transfer the money from my wallet to the cab driver's wallet having developed having started as a payments company paytm uh, like you would see here this is a very crowded space paytm quickly pivoted from just a payments company and this is just a snapshot of the services being offered by paytm today these are not the entire services that paytm offers they provide point of sale solutions so they have their own machines which the uh, the restaurants or shops which have signed up with paytm can be you know provided through paytm they provide business loans to customers to businesses they provide you can purchase insurance on paytm they provide personal finance solutions you can you know purchase uh, stocks you can purchase mutual funds you can purchase gold for investment now you can there is an e-commerce e, uh, e platform the paytm mall they recently obtained by recently i mean two years back they've obtained the banking license and you, you can uh, pay the utilities bill the last point is very interesting so the last point is a very recent development as recent as two months ago paytm has started a mini app store now this will compete exclusively this will com compete head on with the google play app store and the apple app store and this dispute or this issue was brought into stark focus uh, because of the dispute between apple and fortnite in the us and uh, that dispute spilled over across the world and even uh, i think paytm briefly got banned by the google play store which might have led to paytm launching i'm not sure i am not privy to the internal discussions of paytm but shortly after paytm was temporarily banned by the google play store Pay uh, there was news that paytm was launching their own mini app store so uh, there may be a connection between these two uh, incidents so this pivoting that has happened is uh, while paytm uh, let me caution you paytm is not the first company in india which has done this before paytm um, did this phone pay another uh, wallet provider uh, yeah phone pay had already successfully uh, introduced merchants on its platform where you could directly purchase uh, services from different merchants so phone pay could be seen as an earlier entrant into the one platform many services model but paytm has been far more successful because of the way they have implemented it and because of their size they have been far more successful in seamlessly integrating the different services that are available on the app and providing them to their customers so these two uh, developments the development of upi and the proliferation of one platform many services are a couple of the new you know a couple of innovations which have been happening in the financial sector in india in the last half a decade five to six years thank you any questions i the floor is open for questions now uh thank you uh, kirti i uh, let me start off with uh, one question uh, you mentioned briefly in the beginning about uh, innovations uh, done by people uh, innovations like miss calls and you know what you characterize as behavioral traits uh, which people uh, brought into uh, the financial system and that has led to then these innovations being taken up by companies or banks and uh, implemented i was wondering uh, 
if if you can throw a little more light on how people interact with uh, these systems in general we know how companies uh, are going about it we know how the state is uh, uh, pushing for it because both companies and states have uh, a particular interest in introducing digital platforms uh, taxation profit and all that but uh, especially uh, uh, how mpesa were, became popular in which people took to it uh, in, in huge numbers in, in kenya and all if you can throw a little more light on what has been the experience of people in general okay so uh, i'll just highlight the slide which is talking about uh, this uh, behavioral uh, traits of the customers so what has happened in missed call banking or mpesa and it was one of these behavioral traits itself which led to the development or uh, which was led to the development of upi which led to one of the core specifications of upi uh, in the case of mpesa it was not uh, as if that people are loath to becoming a part of the financial system it was not that people didn't want to be a part of the formal banking sector it was just that even if they wanted to be a part of the banking sector the infrastructure was not present so uh, the telecom companies were much more successful in penetrating the so the traditional way of banking that uh we know that there needs to be a branch the branch needs to be staffed with people there needs to be systems in the branch be it computers or ledgers you know accounting systems and if there is computers you need to have access to good power good connectivity to allow that uh, the systems to uh, coordinate or to speak with the central server all of this all of this costs a lot of money on the other hand for a telecom uh, provider i'm not saying that setting up a telecom tower is cheap or uh, setting up uh, infrastructure for telecom services is cheap but a telecom provider uh, they were able to develop inroads into these unbanked markets uh, markets which were not serviced by the banking sector uh, much more extensively than the banking sector itself was able to uh these costs that the banking sector has in terms of setting up a branch or staffing the branch they are recouped primarily through the services that the banks provide it could be loans it could be credit cards it could be uh, different financial products and services that the banks provide insurances uh, different kinds of mortgages and all that stuff but the capability of the people who are there in those areas is not that high for them to utilize the services like taking an auto loan or taking a home loan uh, taking out a credit card so the banks did not see the uh, benefits that they can obtain from the cost in you know there is no there is no benefit that the bank was seeing from the cost that they were incurring in india uh the banking system rules were such that if you wanted a banking license you had to commit to opening a certain number of branches in the rural areas or in areas which were not serviced by banks but these rules were not present across the world that is by the way these rules uh, that are present in india is one reason why a lot of foreign banks don't operate don't operate as a company or a banking system in india but uh they operate as you know individual project offices or individual offices so city bank for example is not does not have an indian entity registered in india because the moment it is registered as an entity in india there is a company that they have set up in india they need to satisfy all the banking regulations which include the number of loans that they are giving out a certain num- uh, no portion of the loans needs to be given up to uh, sme enterprises or to agriculture or farmers and all that stuff the number of branches there is a certain minimum requirement in terms of where they can place the branches and stuff like that so some banks a lot of foreign banks in india don't have an entity in, in the presence in india in the form of you uh, know a corporation so to work around these regulations now this difficulty in terms of you know getting a return on the costs you put the telecom companies were able to sidestep this because 
at the end of the day, communication was a basic human necessity and people would purchase phones, a small feature phone, which costs about 1000 rupees, $14. But nonetheless, a feature phone and, you know, use that to communicate with their relatives, communicate with customers. Uh, in India, for example, we see that a rickshaw wala also, a rickshaw wala is a person uh, of, you know, who pedals a cycle rickshaw. Even they have a mobile phone, a feature phone costing about $14, $20, which they use to communicate with clients, customers, regular customers who utilize the rickshaw or to you know, communicate, keep it, stay in touch with his or her family members. So now telecom companies saw the return that they were, uh, you know, return for the investments they were making. They also uh, tied up with the local communities to help or to encourage them to you know protect the infrastructure that was set up in those communities the tower the generator facility which was uh, installed with the tower to keep the tower running and so on and so forth now because they were able to develop a network in the hinterlands of these emerging economies they also needed now for the person to start utilizing the service the person needs to recharge their phone every so often or recharge the talk time the balance on their phone every so often every month or so or pay the bill every month or so. So they need to have a local presence in terms of somebody who's either selling the recharge packs or collecting the money from the people or uh, their monthly bills. So it was these two, uh, you know, the success of them being able to roll out the network into the hinterlands of the country, developing the countries, and the presence in the form of people who are either selling the recharge vouchers or collecting the money from the bills, monthly bills. It was the combination of this which allowed them, uh, which through which they came up with this idea. And the way M-Pesa works is, so Professor Faisal is, uh, say, a relative of mine. He is in uh, uh, a different state altogether, uh, and I need to transfer money to Professor Faisal. So what I do, I load my uh, mobile number, one, two, three, four, five, six, which is a number registered on Vodafone. I load my mobile number with uh, $20 or $30, whatever Professor Faisal needs, and then put in an instruction on my mobile phone. Now, this instruction could be in the form of an SMS sent to a central number or a code which I type on the phone called the USSD code. Now, the USSD code, uh, a lot of you, if you are uh, watching, Right now, you can just open up your phone, open the keypad, and dial star 06 hash. This immediately gives you the IMEI number, the unique identifier for your phone. But this number, star 06 hash, is an example of a USSD code. This is done without uh, any requirement for a call or any uh, requirement for a message or a call that I need to place to the carrier. It just immediately uh, coordinates with the local tower and an instruction is sent to the local tower or, you know, depending on the code you enter. So star 06 hash, the code does not go to the tower, it immediately your phone processes it and it gives you the IMEI number. In case of certain other codes, the instruction is sent to the mobile tower and uh, in the instructions are processed. So the USSD code, using the USSD code, I once I've loaded about $20 on my phone, which I need to transfer to Professor Faisal, I send an instruction through a missed call, through an SMS, or through the USSD code, asking Vodafone to transfer that $20 to Professor Faisal. So the talk time in my account is reduced by $20, and the talk time in Professor Faisal's account is increased. So Professor Faisal can then use that $20 to pay for different services. So if he was buying groceries, he takes the number of the grocery shop and transfers the talk time to the grocery guy. If he's using an auto rickshaw or a taxi, he takes the number of the taxi driver and transfers the money to the taxi driver, depending on what service he or she is using. He can also go to the Vodafone store and transfer the money to the, uh, the store, uh, the Vodafone representative and get cash in return for the talk time. Of course, after the commission is charged by Vodafone. So these are, uh, you know, the easy ways in which how M-Pesa, in a way, bypassed the regular banking system and allowed people to do financial transactions through uh, this 
alternate to the banking system. Now, a question might arise that isn't that dangerous? Are, are you not creating a shadow banking or a shadow financial structure? Yes, which was one of the difficulties or one of the challenges that telecom companies faced, you know, which was registering and ensuring that everybody, every SIM card or every uh, subscriber that they had was a genuine individual and not somebody who was using it, gaming the system, trying to you know launder money or use money for nefarious purposes. There are a lot of issues were there and with this, but I think the mobile companies have overcome this difficulty. This in you know difficulty about remembering who to transfer, what to transfer. This was one of the core principles that UPI had in mind when they created the system and they did not want to go you know, with information of banking, bank account details and all that. Just the virtual payment address was sufficient. So Kirti at Barclays, you transfer money immediately by saying send so and so amount of money to Kirti at Barclays. I don't need to share anything else. I don't need to share my bank account details with you, which protects you know, me from fraud as well. At the same time, when you enter Kirti at Barclays, immediately the app which you are using verifies and tells you who uh, the name of the person is who's registered with Kirti at Barclays. So if you type in Kirti at Barclays and it shows a Professor Faisal's name, then it's a red flag to you that maybe this is a fraudulent activity. Uh, Professor Faisal? Uh... We are running out. We are running out of time. For uh, we have one more question from Amlan, uh, and then we we can go on a break. So I just wanted to inform you. So yeah, the question says is how do companies like Paytm make their money? Why can't consumers and businesses use UPI without the companies like Paytm and PhonePay? So uh, for business consumers, we can actually uh, bypass Paytm and phone pay. But uh, for businesses, like I mentioned, the daily transaction limit uh, kicks into place. For a mom and pop store, yes, we can buy for a Kirana store, for a grocery store, small local grocery store, we can bypass the uh, intermediaries like Paytm and phone pay. But uh, for any decent, uh, medium size to a large store, the daily transaction limits come into play and we uh, there is a daily transaction limit of one lakh rupees and we cannot, uh, it's a hard transaction limit and it is reset every night at around mid, uh, midnight. So uh, if you, even you cannot make transfers more than one lakh rupees and I'm not sure if you can receive money also more than one lakh rupees using the UPI system. So that uh, you need to start then utilizing uh, intermediaries, uh, pro providers who give you POS machines, providers who provide you with business accounts and all that stuff. I hope that answers your query. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kirti. That was uh, quite an extensive survey of uh, emerging technologies, especially related to payments in India. Uh, we will take a break now till 4.10. We have overshot uh, two and a half minutes, but uh, uh, we'll take a break till 4.10. And then we will come back uh, to the lecture by uh, Professor Shohini Sen Gupta on issues in privacy and regulation in relation to digital finance. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, the first is this idea of why finance and technology are interdependent uh, in a strange way, have a symbiotic relationship on the one hand, uh, but also pose great competition to each other, uh, which is a really strange, uh, you know, behavioral aspect. Uh, in it. So, so there is a, a bit of a symbiotic relationship along with uh, posing challenges to each other. So that's, that's the first idea we're going to discuss. Following from that, I thought it's going to be a nice idea uh, to talk about, you know, what um, you know, Professor Kirti was speaking about. One platform, many voices. 
the WeChats and the uh, you know Alibabas and the PTMs of the world. Um, you know how we are converging the world instead of disaggregating from it, uh, which is precisely um, what makes regulating big tech or fintech so hard, particularly in emerging markets. Um, following from that, we're going to talk a little bit about fintech and identity because that is a re very relevant part of um, most regulatory aspects or law and policy aspects in the world. Uh, but this is very, very important for what's happening in uh, Africa, in India, um, and, and in most other emerging countries. Um, I'm going to give you a brief snapshot of what's happening in India, um, both pre-COVID uh, and you know once you know what's what's the Reserve Bank of India, which is the central bank regulator. Uh, what how is the digital financial service scene changing in India post the COVID-19 phase? Um, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about recent regulatory trends and hopefully end um, you know on on a on a vision for the future and what we can expect to see as we go forward. Um, okay, so as we're speaking, the idea that finance and technology are related and, and dependent on each other for their growth is not a new idea. Um, as much as we like to talk about digital financial services, um, this kind of proliferation of technology in financial services, as, and as much as we view it, as a recent phenomena, uh, it's been around for ages. Uh, so most uh, colonial expeditions across the world, um, you know, if you look at Portuguese, uh, at, at, at Portuguese exp expeditions, French expeditions, British expeditions, um, all colonial ventures uh, were backed by finance, uh, backed by some of the biggest banks and financial institutions. And when you talk about technology in this context, um, you know, it's always been useful for financial institutions to be one of the earliest adopters of technology. Um, this is simply because it helps you uh, aggregate more data quickly, even analog data, uh, and service markets really quickly. Um, of course, if we talk about the world today, um, this intermediation has become very, very complicated. Uh, the reason we started talking about Ant Financial was because uh, as you know, Jack Ma um, in 2004 started this company called Ant Financial. He was, of course, uh, also the founder of Alibaba. Um, and Ant Financial was doing financial service activities. So it was giving loans to people, credit services, wealth management, payment services, etc. cetera. Uh, very shortly afterwards, Alipay started. Um, Alipay as you know, any other um, digital financial app that we all use today including Google, uh, Google Pay or Apple Pay. Uh, so Alipay became one of the biggest sort of names in emerging countries uh, in China and across the world. Um, and starting on from that, um, very quickly, you know, it, it became a huge financial services uh, you know, player. Um, however, a couple of years back, uh, there was a, 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 strat a strategic shift to calling Ant Financial only Ant, uh, because the company wanted to posture as a technology company and not a financial company. Even though most of, most of the revenues of Ant Financial were coming in from the credit services that it was giving and not from pure tech uh, services, in spite of its services being financial in nature, it rebranded itself as a technology company. Uh, and the reason for this is complicated. One, as, as Professor Keithy was talking about, uh, banks and financial systems in general are regulated with a very heavy hand, uh, particularly post the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, this is both in India and across the world. Um, and therefore, it's, we are seeing more and more technology companies uh, invest heavily in financial services as the, as the first frontier or as a gateway into the market uh, and quickly turning financial services into financial plus plus services. Um, which is what perhaps Professor Kirti meant by saying one platform, many voices, which means if I want um, to transact in uh, you know, Alipay, I don't want to use cash. Um, if I want a whole plethora of services uh, at a, at a one -stop, as a one-stop solution, uh, I'm simply going to download an app today. Uh, I don't want to go to my bank. Um, I don't want to have my uh, financial services disaggregated from my other services. So I'll simply log on to, you know, um, you know, an app. Uh, you know, we, have, we were talking about Paytm in India, or we can talk about Alibaba. You can talk about the Amazons of the world, um, or Facebooks, uh, you know, of the world going forward. 
where you utilize one particular platform uh, for everything, for your entertainment needs, for your e-commerce needs, uh, for getting a loan while you're watching a television show, perhaps, and transacting in, um, in, in, in a digital financial currency. Um, so this kind of, uh, you know, uh, aggregation of, of very varied, traditionally very varied services has obviously created many kinds of dilemma on how to regulate them. Uh, so good question to ask is, how do you regulate Google Pay? Because Google Pay is not separate from Google. Similarly with Alipay um, or Facebook, you know, WhatsApp Pay has launched in many parts of the world. WhatsApp Pay uh, is taking on in a big way in India uh, and it is going to proliferate in India in coming times. How do you regulate something like that? Um, and we'll talk more about how the world of data is related to the world of finance in a bit. Um, but I think it's, it's important to appreciate that regulators, whether they are competition regulators or financial stability regulators, always are juggling between different policy objectives. Do you foster, do you foster innovation in the market, which means that you allow fintech companies or you know, technology companies to invest in financial services and hence, you know, create these new products that can reach more number of people faster, uh, like M-Pesa, um, or do you regulate them with a heavy hand, um, you know, so as to prevent, you know, so as to prevent, you know, from data being manipulated or misused? Um, do you, uh, you know, regulate them as technology companies, as banking firms, or as, you know, shadow banks? So it's very difficult to categorize them. In India, of course, this is an evolving question. Um, and so far, um, RBI, which is the Reserve Bank of India, which is India's um, central bank regulator, and is also responsible for the monetary policy, financial stability, and also in a large way, financial inclusion mandates uh, of the country, is struggling with these kinds of questions as well. And we'll come to that in a bit, maybe. Um, but these are some of, this is some, one of the reasons why regulating big tech is so hard. Um, and I'm using the word big tech with fintech synonymously. And that's, and I'm doing that very deliberately because a lot of big tech um, sort of technology companies are investing very heavily in financial services. Uh, this is of course true for Latin America, uh, for China, and even for most uh, fintech companies and digital financial services uh, that are you know, being offered by private companies in India. Most of them have a lot of Chinese investment. Um, so this world, when we talk about, you know, talking about India, is not really so far removed uh, from the world in China or in other emerging markets, um, which is why I, perhaps we are talking about them synonymously. Um, so yes, so that's one of the big challenges. Now, the second big challenge of regulating um, this technology, this, this very odd creature of technology and finance is because of what um, the Financial Stability Board and uh, BIS calls DNA, right? So DNA stands for data analytics, uh, network externalities and interwoven activities. Um, it's important to remember before we jump into the question of law and policy, uh, is that one of the ways in which these companies earn a lot of money is as I said, number one is because finance is always the first frontier, by which I mean, if you want to start an e-commerce company, most e-commerce companies or most uh, Tencents and Alibabas, uh, even Paytms of the world, uh, started off with providing some aspect of, of some financial service. It's usually um, a kind of payment system, a digital payment system. And from that, it expands very rapidly. Uh, so financial pro provisioning of financial services is often a revenue stream, that's one. And the second ever increasing uh, revenue stream is access to data. And this is why I said big tech companies are, are, you know, on one hand reliant on traditional financial services, because if you look at the, say, an example of Google Pay, um, Google Pay doesn't, cannot operate without banking systems, right? So most technology companies don't want to really do the dirty job of setting up banks, uh, setting up, you know, depositories of their own. So they use traditional networks provided by financial services, like they will use your existing bank account, um, they will use central depositories, they will use other mechanisms or infrastructures that are already laid out, and they use that highway to navigate, uh, you know, their way uh, through the system. 
Uh, so on, in that perspective, they are interdependent or they're sort of reliant on traditional financial services like banks. Um, on the other hand, uh, because they rely uh, so much on aggregating data and utilizing data of customers, which is manifold compared to what traditional financial services, service providers like banks used to do, um, they have a very unique dimension to them. And which is why this is, and this is the reason why tech companies are posing as one of the biggest competitors um, of banking firms and most other traditional financial service sector firms. Um, so the big, big competition question in the future is not banks versus banks. It's mostly banks versus other technology companies which have entered the banking arena. Um, and one, as I said, the, one of the biggest reasons why they're able to provide this competition is because of their investment um, in big data, in AI, um, and this ability to A, gather people on this one platform, uh, which means that you don't just get access to people's banking and financial data, you also get access to other kinds of non-traditional data formats. So for example, if I'm on Amazon and I'm using Amazon Pay, um, as opposed to a bank, you know, as opposed to using a debit card or a credit card of a bank uh, on a banking app or, you know, in traditional financial services, I'm on Amazon. I'm also watching, uh, you know, some of my favorite TV shows or movies on Amazon. I'm also doing almost all my purchases on Amazon. So when Amazon pay or when Amazon decides to lend, say, some product to me or it wants to extend lending services to me or it wants to do my credit scoring, uh, it doesn't just have access to my financial data. Uh, it also has access to my entertainment data, my uh, purchase data, um, you know, what I'm buying, where I'm buying, you know, what my, uh, you know, uh, salary probably is, do I shop in sales or not? All of these traditionally, uh, traditional formats of data are being included in the data analytics uh, format of big tech organizations, which is why they are able to provide uh, financial services at a fraction of cost and at a fraction of speed. Uh, so a good example of this, uh, taking on from Professor Keithi's part of the presentation, M-Pesa, uh, which, was, which was launched, of course, in Kenya with huge, with, in Kenya and Tanzania, sorry, uh, with huge success, tied up um, with telecom companies, uh, particularly Tala and uh, Safaricom, and uh, telecom companies and credit scoring companies tied up with M-Pesa to extend or to utilize the existing channels or uh, customer network services to extend loans or uh, to extend you know, other financial services that they have to provide, right? Um, so these network externalities only become stronger and stronger. Um, the customers that Facebook gets were not customers that traditionally came on Facebook or Amazon because of the financial services they were providing. It's because of their brand name a brand that encapsulates finance and other things, which is why customer trust as well is much higher sometimes um, in case of fintech companies or even in case of digital financial services um, or a provider of digital financial services as we see. Um, so this capacity to utilize data very well, uh, both in terms of aggregation and utilization, these very strong network connections because they are providing this one-stop solution to all your needs. And because of this very complicated mesh of interwoven activities, um, so for example, your WhatsApp and your Instagram and your Facebook, and WhatsApp pay are all under one brand. And it's, uh, this is what this interwovenness along with the data capabilities and net network externalities makes uh, their services so profitable. Uh, and also makes uh, you know regulating these companies extremely hard. Uh, this is called the DNA feedback, um, and this is where large banks have not traditionally been able to compete with uh, big tech firms. Now, coming on, moving on from this one sort of challenge uh, in India, particularly, um, you know, we uh, have this. You know, as, as Professor Keithi mentioned, um, we have the Jandhan account. Uh, the Jantan account is essentially a uh, very low cost or, you know, opening of bank accounts at almost no cost. Uh, this is a provision, you know, this is a facility that uh, was extended by the government of India. Um, 
tied along with this is, is this thing called Aadhaar in India, which is your unique identification number that is given to you. Um, now, Aadhaar in India or similar biometric identity systems uh, that are proliferating across the world today and is, is the newest frontier of the fintech market, um, particularly in emerging countries, in the context of finance is so lucrative for companies is because at the heart of fintech lies the concept of establishing the financial identity of the person you're lending money to. The reason why banks and financial services, service providers became such good intermediaries is because uh, they were dealing with strangers and they were able to assess whether I could pay back the loan or, you know, uh, in other words, they are very good risk assessors, right? And one of the ways in which you assess risk is by finding out who you're lending to or who you're providing your financial services to. Um, this prioritizes uh, a huge deal of focus on who the person is, right? So the identity of the person. Now, with respect to Aadhaar in India or with respect to other biometric identification systems, uh, which perhaps were never launched um, by governments with the, with the sole objective of, of providing a financial identity system. They were meant more for general identity systems, but have of course been co-adopted by the financial services and now FinTech market for establishing financial identity is a huge part of what's happening in India today. Uh, the questions of privacy, the questions of who does this data belong to? Uh, because as I said, this data is not purely a financial data. Your identity data is a part of many other things. It's a part of your personality. Uh, your identity data is now used to provide pension services, uh, ration services, um, passports, um, accessing any government where, you know, sort of uh, welfare mechanisms, um, accessing, you know, telecom service providers, uh, you know, getting a new mobile phone, for instance. Um, so the concept of your biometric identification is linked to multiple parts of your identity, one of which is financial. Now, of course, this raises question of who does this aggregated mass of data belong to? Does it belong to the government? Does it belong to the fintech companies? Does it actually belong to you and me? Because we are the repositories of the data, right? So this creates a very complicated system because you, it's, it's a very lucrative form. Um, as I said, you know, it, it helps uh, establish financial identities very quickly. It helps um, make systems more cyber secure on one hand. It makes, um, it prioritizes security, et cetera. On the other hand, it also poses big questions of uh, data privacy and data protection. Um, so for example, uh, the, you know, in, in M-Pesa, uh, for instance, coming back to that idea, uh, Tala, which is a credit scoring and a, and a financial services firm, which tied up with M-Pesa in Kenya, uh, was able to extend, uh, is now able to extend a loan to you in under two minutes, which is incredible. There is no bank in the world today that you can go to and ask for a, submit a loan uh, documentation and expect to get a loan in two minutes. Um, but this is possible because of the DNA loop that we spoke about, and also because they're able to very quickly establish your credit score or your credit worthiness. Uh, and this, they are pulling from data, not just from your uh, financial data, as I said, but other kinds of data. So for instance, if I am a big shopper during sale on Amazon, maybe uh, I'm living beyond my means, maybe I'm not credit worthy, in spite of the fact that my bank account statement shows a huge influx of money every month as part of my salary, right? So this, these kinds of interwoven mesh now of identity systems with FinTech is, is, is causing um, a lot of questions with respect to law and policy. Even with respect to law, and we'll come to this in a bit, um, in about five minutes time, you, financial identity or identity systems are, are a tussle between different regulatory authorities. Um, so you have, as I said, the competition regulator of any country trying to you know, reduce monopoly maybe, um, or trying to reduce dominance in the market. Uh, you will have a data protection authority, which India does not have, uh, but if you did have a data protection authority, they would be utilized, I mean, they would be focusing on how to prevent identity thefts and how to prevent misuse of data by, companies and governments both. Um, so these questions have become very interlinked with the digital financial services market and understanding the fintech market will require, at least in the future, 
uh, a very keen understanding of uh, identity systems. Um, so this is this is another uh, part of, of emerging market scenario. Um, of course, during the coronavirus pandemic, we saw a very uh, utilization of existing uh, infrastructures. So, for instance, in Somali um, in Somaliland, uh, you saw uh, traditional digital payment services apps being used to deliver e-health services. Uh, this was also being done in in Kenya and Tanzania for a while uh, when M-Pesa was launched. Um, you know, uh, Brazil's uh, central bank released P2P lending regulations. Um, you know, Indonesia used its existing digital payment services to provide e-food voucher programs. And we'll come to what's happening in India as well. Um, but the idea that you can use existing financial services to deliver non-financial uh, services like health services during the pandemic is, is a very interesting and is an emerging field that we are seeing most prolifically, um, you know, after the Ebola crisis, we saw that in Sierra Leone and maybe across the world uh, now during COVID-19. Um, of course, this creates the same kinds of questions as to who is providing these kinds of services. And the more aggregation you do, the more questions comes, uh, the more questions uh, uh, come up about who owns this kind of aggregation of data, uh, who gets to control the data, who gets to utilize it, process it, store it, transmit. All of this creates uh, data protection, uh, you know, raises data protection questions. Um, in India, of course, um, just moving away from the COVID-19 scenario for a bit, um, there are a couple of things that have happened in the past uh, you know, few years. One, uh, India had a huge demonetization, which means that around 85% of our currency was, was you know, uh, declared invalid overnight. Um, that, uh, you know, that sort of measure by the government of India created a massive and almost in instantaneous market for digital financial services in India. Um, again, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, it's a good thing because uh, this was required for a while. Uh, but of course, this has raised severe questions of exclusion, um, especially in a country like India, which is, which is very cash heavy. And digital financial services have still not made inroads into many sectors in India, uh, for many communities in India. Uh, this does remain a major point of exclusion. Uh, so there has been that development. Following from which, on the regulatory aspect, um, Indian regulators are now trying to create information databases, uh, which they can use to uh, better regulate companies. Uh, and this is one trend we're seeing across emerging markets is because, because big tech firms can provide things so cheaply, and because they come in on the pretext of financial inclusion or serving the unbanked, um, they have a bit of a negotiating ground with regulators, uh, which is why it is incumbent um, that you know, regulatory systems uh, invest very heavily in technology as well, which is one very big thing that we are seeing in India as well, that regulators, different regulatory bodies, the government of India has set up multiple committees on FinTech. We have recently seen the launch of regulatory sandbox earlier, uh, both in the fin in, you know, in various uh, financial services. So we have a regulatory sandbox for banking services, for insurance services, also for you know, now capital markets. Um, all of this, I suppose, is a, is a focus of the regulator and this realization that if regulators don't invest in technology themselves, A, they, you can't regulate uh, companies which, have, which thrive on their ability to utilize technology so well, and B, um, the modern uh, sort of financial services industry has go undergone a massive shift because of big data and AI. Um, so this has been, been some of the major sort of responses. In terms of coronavirus, of course, uh, you know, RBI has, has started, the Reserve Bank of India has started a number of initiatives, including, you know, all the things that Professor Kirti spoke about, UPI payments, RTGS, etc. All of these have been made 24 7 because there is a push away from using cash uh, because you want to uh, you know reduce people meeting face to face and and you know exchanging currencies and notes um rbi has also started uh, an online dispute resolution uh this is an excellent sort of uh, and much needed regulatory uh, sort of policy um and now with platform which is uh, service uh, neutral which means that if you are simply a consumer of financial services, you don't need to sit and, and you know, understand 
who to raise your complaints to. You can simply log on here. It's a very simple format and you can log in your complaints. Uh, and this is, of course, very important during a pandemic. Now, with respect to recent trends, as I said, you know, the recent trends are multiple. One, there is a push from just digital banking um, and digital financial systems to a more open banking and open financial service provider system, which means that banks uh, for limited functions are tying up with third service providers. In India, they are, they are called account aggregators. And of course, they are called by different names in different uh, jurisdictions. And um, this kind of tie up uh, uh, is, is, is one of the newest sort of innovation that we are seeing. Uh, and because of that, there is a lot of regulation, um, legal regulation around uh, sort of uh, seeing how to regulate account aggregators. Second, the question of what is sensitive customer data, right? So this question begs two things. One, who is a customer? As we were speaking about exclusion. Um, so because of, for example, use of uh, biometric identification systems, who are you identifying as credit worthy? Who are you not? Who is excluded? Who is not? Who is visible? Who is not? Uh, what kind of data, personal data, non-personal data, what is sensitive data are questions that most regulatory systems are asking now. Um, linked to this, we are also asking questions about, you know, understanding and acknowledging that yes, entry of technology into financial services market is a given reality and is going to continue to be a given reality, uh, particularly for emerging markets that are looking for more financial inclusion measures. Uh, if that is the case, should we extend deposit insurance and other kinds of laws and regulations which were traditionally crafted for financial services to these firms as well? Instead of, instead of banning them or instead of saying that we are not going to acknowledge the problem, uh, do we make a change in our regulatory perspective and say, okay, now that maybe you know, Paytm is providing digital financial services, maybe Google Pay is, is servicing, you know, 100,000 people, should we extend certain kinds of guarantees uh, and, and maybe consumer protection um, codes that were existing for traditional, you know, um, customers of, of banks, should we extend that to these companies as well, right? And the last big trend is, of course, of decentralization. Um, in India, uh, the Reserve Bank of India has had a bit of a tiff, uh, a bit of a, um, uh, sort of unpleasant uh, history with cryptocurrencies, uh, and but it, it is open to blockchain. Um, but this is something that we are seeing in emerging markets specifically, um, that there is a push towards decentralization. Uh, and this is, of course, very relevant for big markets like China, Brazil, and India, where centralized regulatory systems are, uh, are facing more challenges as we go on. Um, so regulatory approaches to fintech, of course, are, and I, I'm just going to not talk about everything on the screen because I think we did touch upon them, but I do want to leave you with two questions. One is that a lot of digital financial services are, are now incumbent on the central question of choices, right? Consumer choices or consent. Um, a, is consent a very good framework when you're talking about countries like India, where you're where the singular mandate of encouraging innovation in the fintech space largely is financial inclusion. Uh, can is consent the same for everyone? And what kind of choices are we giving to which people? Uh, so that's one question to ask. And I, you know, I hope you will ask these questions to yourself um, as much as regulators are asking these questions to themselves. And the second is of free services. Um, just because a service is free, just because a loan is provided to you in two minutes. Um, we need to move the dial from efficiency um, to appropriateness. Is it appropriate that a loan is given under two minutes? Uh, what are the systems that are going behind the scenes? Uh, whether that means we need to, you know, sort of decode black box AI, or whether that means we need more technology regulation in general is a question I leave to you. Um, and the third uh, and last thing is, should we focus on individual or structural changes? Is poverty a question of simply, you know, providing an unbanked person a bank account? Um, is so, which is an individual response to a crisis, or is it is it because of other sociological reasons uh, that somebody doesn't want or is not comfortable or doesn't have access to financial services? Um, and of, my sense is that often it is a question of both. Um, uh, but unfortunately, we see less focus on structural changes and more focus on individual changes. Um, 
so that, that's, that's one of the largest trends, uh, regulatory trends or questions that regulators are asking. Uh, in terms of what the future looks like, and I will take perhaps maybe a minute to sum it up, um, especially when you look at laws and regulations, um, if, we, if I had to summarize it in a sentence, uh, the aim of good legal and regulatory systems should be to one, protect against, which means you envisage what harms can take place in the future and you protect people against them on one hand. And the second more activist -y sort of role of regulators is to promote things. As I said, India has, you know, uh, has recently launched a regulatory sandbox. India is thinking about uh, launching innovation hubs, um, whether it's through, you know, Mexico having a new fintech law uh, or other kinds of, you know, um, really opening up the market. That's one role that regulators will have to pay, uh, play if it wants to be on top of the game. That's one. And in terms of protection, you will, we will have to figure out who to protect from what. So which means that we need to have better institutional mechanisms, um, mechanisms that are rooted in accountability and transparency rather than uh, you know, uh, ad hoc uh, and on the, you know, you can't really regulate something much in advance, but it's also important for regulators to, to understand future harms and protect people against them um, as and when, you know, uh, before the damage is done. So before Cambridge Analytica happens, uh, before a large scale data misuse happens, it is incumbent upon regulators, particularly financial service regulators to protect people against it um, because a fallout here will not just be privacy and data protection, it can also potentially lead to a complete collapse of the financial system in general. And a good example, and I leave you to sort of research on this, is the RBS Bank in Scotland, um, which collapsed uh, in, in Scotland and completely all, all uh, you know, caused a mini financial stability scare uh, because the IT system in the bank uh, collapsed for a day. Um, so uh, we require both of these uh, parallel sort of um, uh, perspectives to keep in mind when you're regulating uh, fintech, big tech, and digital financial services. Um, with that, I will pause here. And uh, if there are any comments, if you, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to take them now. Thank you, Shonini. That was uh, very exciting, uh, especially the way you were able to uh, give us a peek into the current atmosphere in digital payments. Uh, we have a question from Soumya Deep. Uh, if you can read it on the chat, then yes. yeah. Yes. There will be a. Uh, I I have a question after that. Uh, mm. Okay. Uh, so this is a tough question, uh, and I don't and I don't want to pretend that I know that I know all the answers to this question. So let's take the first question: the principle behind consent. Uh, and this is a big question being asked, not just in financial services, but also, of course, uh, largely in, um, you know, in, in data protection and privacy circles as well. The question is, is consent a good framework? And as I said, this is very relevant, of course, for, uh, you know, markets like India, um, because consent ultimately depends on choices. Um, and it's a good question to ask if the choices that we make um, are really choices that are in our control. Uh, so a good example of this is, say, micro pensions um, or, or uh, you know, linking your biometric identification systems to provisioning of uh, welfare mechanisms. So if you tell me um, that, I, that I have to consent to a, to a data protection agreement to access my pensions without which I cannot survive, uh, which is the case in India, for example, uh, if you want to access, you know, widow pensions in India, if you want access to certain kinds of uh, government service uh, provisions, you will have to share certain kinds of data, including your biometric data. A good question to ask there is consent even the right mechanism? Mm -hmm. um, the second part of the question um, is, is that law tries to deal with in two ways. If consent is the mechanism, you try to create different frameworks for consent. Uh, in many jurisdictions, um, regulators will actually give a draft of what kind of consent mechanisms we need to take or need to stick to when we're talking about um, um, servicing particular communities. Um, but frankly, in India, we still don't have a data protection act. We don't even have a financial consumer protection law, um, which has been a long standing uh, demand of, of, of the industry. Um, first suggested by the Raghuram Rajan report in 2009, 
uh, and also recommended throughout. So we don't have you know those basic mechanisms in place right now. So how does India deal with it is a good question to ask in the future. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Shohini. I have a follow-up question. I mean, uh, uh, if, if we go back like 200 years now, when the Imperial Bank actually surfaced into India when, with the British, what we had earlier was the Sarafs who were money changers. These, these were the banking institutions we had or the Chettiar community, which were the bankers specifically who had wide networks, they used Hawala, but they also used other community networks to move uh, uh, finances around. Mm -hmm. One of the problems uh, for the Imperial Bank, because it had gained political clout already, was to be able to even understand how Hawala works or how do community networks of banking work. So after a point, they basically gave up trying to understand it and started to use them as a source of penetrating into finance. Mm -hmm. This is how they started to, and so uh, they use them to penetrate fine into finance, but they also accuse them of money lending and ex charging exorbitant rates. But that's exactly what they were doing because uh, Imperial Bank would give them loans and they would add two more percent of interest and give it to other common people. Uh, I, I, I don't know if this is a parallel, but I see a, comp uh, I see a, a certain type of revival of the same experience here is that we already have a banking network, mm -hmm. which is a state-owned banking network, the SBIs and all that. And then you have big tech companies which come in and uh, try to use that network. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least the 200 year back experience was that the uh, cost of finance had increased exponentially. Uh, uh, not exponential, but but it to a great extent it did increase, uh, and it in a way also routed out a lot of indigenous financial networks after a point because of the contrary discourse which went on. So, do you see any type of that changes coming about, especially to the state, because the state uh, has complete monopoly over deciding on financial policy, but now with Google or or big companies coming in are there going to be challenges? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because um, it's something that I've been thinking about as well. And of course, there's a lot, this is, I'm going to re restrict my comments to India, um, particularly for colonial uh, countries with a colonial past like India. If you look at the evolution of banking law, for instance, in India um, or in countries like India, you will see that, you know, the utilitarians who drafted the laws like Macaulay, um, you know, always looked as um, law, you know, the law as a way to civilize uh, the vast population. So the, the law was always used as a form of governance um, as a colonial civilizing mission. That has always been the case in India. Um, and you're absolutely right. If we look at the history of, of community banking in India, uh, particularly during the, the British colonial time in India, some of the, the community bankings that existed in India, uh, and a good example of this, and a very convenient example for me to use is uh, this money lender called Jagat Seth. Uh, for those who don't know, Jagat Seth was a massive money lender, and he used to lend, he was so big that he used to lend to both the French and the Britishers in India um, for their respective colonial projects. Um, if you look at the development of the Indian Contract Act, it also developed because of this particular colonial context. Um, the reason I am giving this kind of uh, maybe perhaps slightly boring introduction to this is that I completely agree with you. Um, the development of financial services and now a proxy to financial services, which is your technology companies, has come at the back uh, of this same history. Uh, so you always try and, and use the existing power networks. Uh, you know, in, in earlier days, it could be existing money lenders, existing banking networks. Uh, you know, law, legal systems. And of course, law is a very important point. As I said, it's always been a, it, it been a way to navigate your system inside a system. So the reason why I mentioned Ant Pay um, or Google Pay is the reason why Google Pay doesn't brand itself as a banking company is because it wants to not come under the ambit of um, banking laws uh, in India and across the world. 
the same reason why Ant Financial changed its name from Ant Financial to Ant. Um, so this is, I absolutely agree that there is a, a push with more influx of technology into finance. We are seeing an aggregation and, an, and a reusing of the existing networks, banking or otherwise. And this has a severe impact on indigenous forms of financial systems. Community banking is one example of this, um, but there are many other examples of this. Uh, innovation as well is being sort of privatized to certain companies. Uh, the reason why I have been using big tech and fintech very synonymously throughout the lecture is precisely for this reason, that most fintech development in India uh, and in emerging markets is being financed by big technology companies, namely you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, of course, expanding that niche to Tencent, WeBank, et cetera. Um, so yes, I'm in complete agreement with you uh, there, Faisal. Thank you. If there are any other questions, there are a few uh, comments by Kirti on YouTube. Uh, but if there are any other questions, then uh, we, we still have time to take them. I'm very happy to take people comments also with challenge. Uh, I need to preface it, put a disclaimer and say that these are my opinions, not anyone else's opinions. Um, so if you uh, want to challenge, that would be also great. There is a question by Kirti, a related uh, is that, would it be feasible for regulators to come up with a framework which covers the different aspects of consent? It's hard. It's the, the, the simple answer is hard, uh, which is why you have data protection laws separate from, you know, we don't have a FinTech or a financial services consent law, but it's hard. Um, but the, it's, it's also good because the framework of consent and autonomy and choices is not a framework that is only relevant for finance. It's also relevant for say identity purposes, um, identity of all kinds uh, for accessing certain kinds of services, for gender, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's difficult to come up with one solution. And that's also perhaps not the smartest way to regulate a market this big and this diverse. Uh, so I would suggest, I mean, most regulators have suggested that you have one harmonized uh, consent framework or a rights framework given to us by data protection, standalone data protection law. And then you have sectoral offshoots of that. Uh, and even there, uh, I would again come back to the question if consent is really what we want to look at for everything, right? We are looking at biometric identification systems to carceral systems to pension systems to banking services and all of which we are, uh, we are viewing sort of with one lens of consent. And I think there is some value in challenging that lens itself. Um, maybe consent is not the right framework. Maybe it's the rights framework. Um, we talk about the unbanked and the poor, and you know, in India, we have a caste system and you know, um, a kind of segregation that continues in India uh, based on multiple grounds of discrimination. Maybe consent for those particular factors like micro pensions and micro insurance firms, consent it may not be the right framework, um, but yeah, we can, we can hope for a world where we have these meaningful conversations happening across regulators. I should preface this by saying that before we go to drafting laws, we need regulatory uh, coordination, which is another big challenge that legal systems are facing. Um, yeah. Thank you, Shohini. Uh, if we, uh, we don't seem to have any more questions. Okay. Uh, uh, I invite uh, uh, Professor Swamidip Roy, who is Assistant Dean of International Strategy at JSPF give us a vote of thanks. Um, thanks very much, Faisal. Digitization and financialization and So Amidip, we can't hear you very well.
Okay. Uh, there seems to be some issue with uh, with the connection there. Uh, on behalf of Jindal School of Banking and Finance and uh, Jindal Global University, uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone who has uh, joined us today for uh, the live lecture or who will be hearing us uh, on, on YouTube after this. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, the speakers, uh, Professor Shohini Sengupta and uh, Professor Kirti Pendial for uh, their expertise and uh, for sharing their expertise and uh, preparing painstaking presentations for our benefit. Uh, I would like to thank people at the at JGU who have helped us to design the program, uh, uh, design the posters, and uh, who have helped us at the back end to uh, put up the live stream for all of you. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I would like to uh, call it a day. Thank you. Thank you all. And see you at.